Good evening, I'm Asha Tomlinson. Ian is away. Tonight, fear and horror after a British MP is murdered. Today is a dark and a, and a shocking day. His door was open to meet constituents. So many MPs today will be scared by this. The growing concern about safety in public life. Millions of Canadians with mixed dose vaccine will be allowed to travel to the US. Forget falling back, Alberta may drop daylight saving. Five months over the winter will feel so much worse. But is the time change good for your health? After 20 years, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck writing together again. When we started out, we were terribly inefficient, and that's what kind of put us off writing. Their new movie with a message. This is The National. In the UK, politics often happen up close. MPs meeting face to face with the people they represent, taking questions, handling concerns. Many see it as democracy at its best, but especially at a time when society seems so divided, it comes with risk. And in the case of David Amos, at a terrible cost. Amos was holding an open meeting for constituents when he was attacked, stabbed several times. A man is in custody. The incident has left politicians in the UK and around the world distressed and questioning how to balance the duty to connect with citizens and the need to stay safe. Margaret Evans on what we know about an attack now considered an act of terrorism. The murder of one of Britain's longest serving MPs in what has now been declared a terrorist incident took place here in the heart of a seaside community in Essex at a church whose doors Sir David Amos kept open to meet with his constituents. Police and paramedics were called to the scene about midday with news emerging that the 69-year-old had been stabbed multiple times. Counter-terrorism police say a 25-year-old British man has been arrested and that early investigation points to a potential motivation linked to Islamist extremism. Flags at Downing Street are at half-mast and there have been tributes to the Conservative backbencher from across the political spectrum. Above all, he was one of the kindest, nicest, most gentle people in politics. Today is a dark and a, and a shocking day, the more so because, heartbreakingly, we've been here before. Hamas is the second serving British MP to have been killed here in the last five years. Joe Cox, a Labour MP and mother, was stabbed and shot to death by a right-wing extremist in her constituency in 2016. Her sister was elected to replace her. And it's really important that we get good people in public life. But this is the risk that we're all taking. You know, and, and so many MPs today will be scared by this. The apparent ease with which the attack took place has inevitably turned attention towards the risks MPs and their constituency workers can be exposed to. The British Home Secretary has ordered a review of security arrangements for all MPs. David Amos was known for being available to his constituents and proud of it. Those who knew him say it would be an unhappy irony if the manner of his death were to make that kind of contact more difficult to preserve. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. The news has shaken politicians around the world, including here in Canada. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tweeting, I am shocked by the news of British MP Sir David Amos, who was stabbed and killed today. Outgoing Cabinet Minister Catherine McKenna, who herself experienced threats, called it appalling, devastating and so sad, adding the rise of hate and violence in politics has to stop. While former Stephen Harper Cabinet Minister James Moore declared going into politics is no longer safe, not for your mental or physical health, not financially. Closing with, parties should come together and address this to protect our democracy. Some developing news tonight in the sexual misconduct crisis facing the Canadian military. Yet another senior official has been put on leave following months of investigation. This time, Lieutenant General Stephen Whalen, who was in charge of military personnel. Murray Brewster joins us now from Ottawa. Murray, take us through the significance of this latest development. Well, Lieutenant General Whalen was the commander of military personnel. 
Well, that's significant because he would be in charge of delivering programs and support for members of the military who may have experienced sexual misconduct. We learned that Wayland had been under investigation since June and that the acting chief of the defense staff was informed of it. Yet, he was allowed to continue serving and only stepped aside this evening. And that was probably because uh, the Globe and Mail, uh, which originally wrote this story a few hours ago, uh, was going to be going to print with, uh, with a story about Wayland. We're told by the Defense Department in the statement tonight that these are historic uh, allegations and that uh, the investigation is continuing. Now, the military has been grappling with this crisis for some time with several high-profile members off the job, right? Well, there have been a number of developments this week, and uh, not the least of which was today uh, in uh, provincial court here in Ottawa. Uh, two weeks have been set aside for the criminal case involving the former chief of the defense staff, uh, General Jonathan Vance. He is charged with one count of obstruction of justice. Uh, not necessarily related to a sexual misconduct allegation, but it is the allegation is related to uh, the military's uh, investigation of General Vance in February. Also this week, uh, the incoming commander of the Canadian Army, Lieutenant General uh, Trevor Cadieu, uh, it was announced that he is stepping aside from uh, his role or his yet to be assumed role, and uh, because he is under investigation for uh, allegations of sexual misconduct. Murray, thank you. Turning to Iqaluit's contaminated water crisis now, the city's 8,000 residents have been under strict order not to use their tap water since Tuesday. Today, they learned what's in it and what will be done to clean it up. Jackie McKay reports. For days, residents of Iqaluit suspected the water coming out of their taps was contaminated. Today's confirmation, they were right. The results of water quality testing show exceedingly high concentrations of various fuel components in the, sam in the sample collected from that tank. Those components consistent with diesel fuel or kerosene. But though the concentration in the tank was high, the health risks are low. It's important to note that the water quality testing of the treated reservoir located downstream from the water treatment plant showed levels well within health limits. Nunavut's chief public health officer says that while some people may have experienced headaches, dizziness or nausea, symptoms should pass within hours with no long-term effects. The compounds that we were most concerned about, uh, like benzene and toluene and, and other chemicals that uh, may have been identified as carcinogens, there's no evidence that those types of chemicals um, there's no evidence that they've been present in Akaluit's water system. Akaluit officials still don't know exactly how this happened. The affected water tank has been isolated from the rest of the system. We, we expect we may find some cracking in the, uh, in the tank somewhere. Meanwhile, most people are getting their water from the nearby river and finding ways to help themselves and each other. Andrea Anderson started a GoFundMe to help buy supplies. I've also seen people who had to purchase um, new gas cans and then fill up the gas cans with water because there was actually no jugs to buy at the store. So that was a huge gap and a lot of people aren't able to afford $20, $30 jugs uh, to fill up the water. Anderson has raised roughly $19,000 in two days. City officials say it will be next week before they might be able to lift the do not consume order. Jackie McKay, CBC News, Akhalui. After not following up on earlier invitations, Justin Trudeau says he will travel to Kamloops on Monday to meet with First Nations leaders. This two weeks after the Prime Minister apologized for skipping an invite to attend a ceremony with the community on the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Trudeau has come under fire for instead opting to vacation in Tofino. Parliament is set to resume November 22nd with a new cabinet. Among the Liberal government's top priorities, extending pandemic support, support benefits. The cabinet will be sworn in October 26th. New rules come into effect for November 8th for travelers looking to get into the U.S. by land or air. The only COVID restriction will be showing proof of full vaccination. And now we know mixed doses of vaccines will count. 
As Thomas Digg explains, for millions of Canadians looking to cross the border, that's a relief. With a lot more traffic about to get moving across the border on November 8th, as the U.S. welcomes fully vaccinated Canadians, those with mixed doses are welcoming this news. I'm thrilled, you know, that finally we have some resolution and some clarity about that. Uh, I only wish they could have done it sooner. Snowbird Ingrid White is one of the millions of Canadians who got shots of two different vaccines, either AstraZeneca, Pfizer or Moderna, providing them protection against COVID-19, but leaving them in limbo for any future travel south of the border, with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control stubbornly refusing to recognize mixed doses as a means of full vaccination. That view abruptly changed with this statement. While the CDC has not recommended mixing types of vaccine in a primary series, we recognize that this is increasingly common in other countries, so should be accepted for the interpretation of vaccine records. In other words, the U.S. will consider White and others like her properly double-dosed. She and her husband had booked a trip to Florida for November, but canceled amid the uncertainty over mixed doses. And now that the borders have been opened again, I think we're going to travel with, we will change our plans back again. That other outstanding issue still lingers though. Canadians hoping to make even a day trip stateside will still need to have a negative PCR test, no more than 72 hours old to return home. Canada's top doctors can't say yet whether that will remain when border restrictions ease. It's a live issue right now. As always, we continue to look at the, the scientific evidence uh, and the results of our current uh, testing regime at, at the border. The change of heart from the CDC comes after what Canadian public health officials described this week as a full court press trying to convince their U.S. counterparts that people from this country with two different doses should be considered fully vaccinated. It'll be one fewer hurdle to cross the border in less than a month. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Ontario announced the launch of its Verify Ontario app. And they've done an incredible job and it's going to be much easier for businesses, including restaurants, uh, to be scanning a, a QR code. It allows businesses and organizations to scan QR codes and verify people have been double dosed. Ontarians can download their QR codes in a phased rollout starting today. The province developed the app partnership with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. More than a month into the school year, concerns remain about the spread of COVID inside classrooms. In Ontario, teachers are required to wear surgical masks, but at least one teacher says he was threatened with disciplinary action for wearing a mask that offered better protection. Deanna Sumanak johnson explains. This Toronto area teacher says he decided to wear an N95 mask in class to protect his baby at home. I was worried about bringing something home. CBC News is concealing his identity to protect his job. He says this principal gave him a friendly reminder that's not the surgical mask teachers are required to wear. But then last week... Yeah, I got pulled out of class on a Friday afternoon and uh, asked to come down and was presented with this letter basically saying you're going to be sent home for the rest of the day without pay and if you don't comply by Monday, you know, further direction will be sent to you. This mask doesn't have a great nose piece, so A, I'm fogging up my glasses like that and so that's a very poor seal. Also, you can see there's gaps on the side. Many experts say N95 style masks offer better protection from airborne viruses like COVID-19 as they seal closely to the face. So N95 masks protect the students and teachers around them, but also protect the teacher who's wearing them. This is very dissimilar from the surgical masks, which protect the other people around them. The Ontario Ministry of Education says medical masks, surgical procedural, are required to be worn by school staff. All school staff will wear medical grade masks. But it doesn't say whether teachers can go a step further and wear more protective masks. The interpretation left to individual boards or principals. The teachers union says the Ontario government should make N95s available to all school staff. This is something the board should be working with us to push the government to invest in proper enhanced PPE. And this is what they should be doing, not disciplining uh, teachers. The teacher in the York Region District School Board says he's now forced to work with a surgical mask that makes him feel unsafe. 
but there are signs the tide is turning. Just this week, two large school boards, the Ottawa Carleton Public and Toronto Catholic, decided to allow teachers to wear N95 style masks if they so choose. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. The Queen was caught on camera reportedly questioning world leaders' action on climate change. Video picking up the Queen's comments was captured during the opening of the Welsh Parliament on Thursday. The Queen isn't the only member of the royal family who spoke out about climate change this week. Prince William told the BBC billionaires should focus on fixing Earth first before funding the space race. But Canadian actor William Shatner doesn't agree with that. In an interview with Entertainment Tonight, he defended his quick trip to space earlier this week, calling it a baby step to show people that space travel can be practical. He also said the prince has the wrong idea because he says space presents an opportunity to move polluting industries off of Earth. It's been just weeks since the Taliban took control of Afghanistan, but that control is being challenged tonight by ISIS. The group is claiming responsibility for one of the deadliest attacks since the U.S. military pullout. At least 47 people killed, dozens more injured, and a suicide bombing at a Shia mosque. Susan Ormiston reports. For the second straight week at Friday prayers, a suicide attack on a Shia mosque, this time in Kandahar the Taliban's heartland. The mosque was full. At the end of prayers, local reports suggest one suicide bomber blew himself up outside and another inside, throwing worshippers to the windows. Cell phone video shows the blood-stained carpets, bodies stretched out. The Mirwaz hospital overwhelmed, calling for blood donations and help with the injured. Just two days ago, CBC interviewed the new Taliban police chief in Kandahar, Abdul Ghaffar Mohammadi. He told us since the takeover, the security situation in the city has been good and people are happy. Not anymore. Bringing stability to Afghanistan was one of the Taliban's promises when it swept into Kabul two months ago. But a string of bomb blasts in the last few weeks have left Afghans anxious about the near future. A massive blast at a Shia mosque in Kunduz killed over 60 people. ISIS-K claimed responsibility, continuing a deadly pattern of targeting minority Muslims. Another bomb outside a Kabul mosque nearly two weeks ago led to a raid on a sleeper cell inside the capital city. Still, last week in the first talks with the U.S. representatives, Taliban leaders said they did not want or need American interventions to hunt down extremist groups. Afghans are fearful and still fleeing toward an exit. Last night, another 350 were flown out of Kabul to Doha including some young female soccer players who are coming to Canada. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Doha. The price of real estate continues to rise across Canada, forcing some to give up the dream of owning a house. It's really sad to find, to find something that you like and then um, not even to get close. Coming up, are better prices on the way or will they continue to soar? Plus... People in Alberta are about to decide if they should keep daylight saving time for good. I like waking up with the sun personally. I think it's good for uh, your health. What will it mean for the rest of Canada? And... I will not be patronized by this squire. Ben Affleck and Matt Damon writing together again. So it was also fun to have Matt have to kneel and bow and scrape because it's a <laughs> lifelong goal of mine. <laughs> We're back in two. Welcome back. For more and more Canadians, the dream of home ownership seems to be slipping away. Today, the Canadian Real Estate Association confirmed what many house hunters already know. Prices just keep shooting up while the available home supply goes down. Nisha Patel takes stock. Isabel Serrano came to Canada 15 years ago. Now she has her own business and had hoped to buy her own home. I know that I'm one of the people who didn't come to this country with money. I had to work my ladder up 
saving and working. But after visiting more than 40 properties and losing out on multiple offers, she's worried her budget can't stretch any further. I think it's very frustrating. It's, uh, it's really sad to find, to find something that you like and then um, not even to get close. Last month, house prices marched higher again. Though the Prairie provinces only saw single-digit gains compared to the year before, housing in New Brunswick now costs a stunning 31% more. This realtor says the Moncton market got a boost from the pandemic trend of house hunters searching for more space and more bang for their buck. Our biggest problem is the lack of inventory. We have a lot more, a lot more buyers than we do sellers and Economics 101 says that's going to drive prices up, right? There are other factors driving demand low interest rates, more investors, and the fear of missing out. Especially in the hottest markets of Vancouver and Toronto, where economists say some buyers are getting extra help. A bank of mom and dad, for lack of a better term, transfers that are happening from parents to their kids to be able to get into a, to, to a house. So it's, it is an extremely tough affordability backdrop. For Serrano, that's not a luxury she has, but she'll continue the search for a home she can afford. I feel that I'm competing with elite only because, uh, you know, from the point of view that you can only buy a house here for over a million dollars, that's not middle class any longer. Still with more Canadian home buyers out shopping this fall, competition will be stiff and their calls to improve affordability will only grow louder. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Government employees in New Brunswick have been ordered to stop making First Nations title acknowledgments at the beginning of public events. Instead, they've been instructed to use government-approved language, which excludes the words unseated and unsurrendered. The government says that's because it's involved in a number of legal actions and land claims from First Nations against the province. Indigenous leaders are calling the ban disrespectful and dishonest. In Nova Scotia, a new plan is in place, allowing several Mi'kmaq communities to fish and sell their catch with federal approval, something they've been fighting for. Those involved are calling it an important step, but as Kayla Hounsel shows us, tensions still remain. Mi'kmaq communities have always maintained they have a right to fish and sell their catch, but most haven't been able to legally do that until now. This is a new approach to say we don't need to go to the license route. Uh, we can do things based on communities developing through their own self-government, their own plans. Last year, the Sebeganegadi First Nation clashed with non-Indigenous commercial fishers after the Mi'kmaq started fishing outside the commercial season. The Mi'kmaq have a treaty right to fish for a moderate livelihood, a right reaffirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada 22 years ago. But the court also gave the government the right to regulate that. And not all communities are negotiating the same. Now four, not including Sebeganegadi, have reached an understanding with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. The individual uh, harvesters uh, who will be operating with the 70 traps, they get their authority and their tags and so forth from the communities themselves. It is not a formal written agreement, but rather an interim understanding to get fishers on the water now. I'm still the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans until the new minister is sworn in. Bernadette Jordan, who many say lost her seat over this issue, says the group will manage 3,500 lobster traps within the federally regulated season. So these are all traps that have already been accounted for. It's not new additional traps. We're really happy and we're really supportive of the agreement and we're eager to move forward side by side with our Indigenous partners on the water this fall. But it does not solve everything. The communities under the plan believe more needs to be done to increase access to the fishery. And for Sebeganegadi, the community at the center of the violence that erupted last fall, there's been no progress at all. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. You may not believe it, but it's been nearly a quarter century since this moment. The Oscar goes to Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. Now the duo is back at it again for a new movie. There is something absurd and sort of funny about the degree to which men uh, compete. Andrew's conversation with them next. You knew what would happen to me should you lose this duel. You knew and you didn't tell me. God will not punish those who tell the truth. 
A scene from the historical epic The Last Duel, opening across Canada tonight. Set over 600 years ago, the story still resonates today. A woman is sexually assaulted, then forced to watch as men decide her fate. Co-stars Matt Damon and Ben Affleck wrote the screenplay with award-winning filmmaker Nicole Hollis Center. Tonight, Andrew sits down with this Hollywood power trio to talk about the movie and its parallels between then and now. And the Oscar goes to Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. The year was 1998, and this was the moment childhood buddies Matt Damon and Ben Affleck broke into the big leagues. I just said to Matt, losing would suck and winning would be really scary, and it's really, really scary. Uh, um, you know, we're, we're, we're just really two young guys who uh, were fortunate enough to be involved with a lot of great people. But they were just getting started. Their careers intertwined for years. But to co-write another blockbuster, that would only happen two decades later. Jacques Legree entered our home. He attacked me. Set in 14th century France, the film is based on a true story about a woman who was raped and risked her life to tell the truth. And to tell this story authentically, the partnership needed to grow. So enter Nicole Holof Center, writer, director, and herself, a student of Martin Scorsese. I sat down to chat with all three, remotely, of course. Must be nice to not have to travel, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, truth be told, I, I wouldn't have mind, uh, minded flying out to see you guys in person, but, but we make do with what we've got. Frankly, I found the class, you know, rather uh, elementary. It's been an awfully long time since you both, I mean, if I'm doing the math right, almost a quarter century, right? Since, since you wrote uh, Good Will Hunting together and you're working on this project, you're starring in it together. I, I can only imagine it must be, as a working relationship, either wonderfully efficient or terribly inefficient. That's funny. Actually, we've, we've run the gamut. I think when we started out, we were terribly inefficient, and that's what kind of put us off writing. We never thought we'd have enough time to do it again. Um, but just kind of through by osmosis, by making movies for 25 years, we've kind of figured out structure. Um, and how these things are structured. And so we actually were, were pretty efficient this time. And, um, and Nicole's really fast too. And like we wrote the script. I There's think. also a difference when you're writing and it's just you and your friend, you know, you, you, but bringing in a writer you really respect who you feel like is a real writer and you have to do it in front of her. You kind of like, you sort of, um, you know, you, you sit up a little straighter. At least Matt did. Definitely. <laughs> I'm terrifying. And our child's fate will be written not by God's will by which old man will tire first. N Nicole, this is a film that is told in three main parts, right? Three perspectives. The two main male characters, and then perhaps most importantly, the female character, Marguerite, uh, whose part you wrote. What was the pressure like on your shoulders to make sure that you get that right? You know, if I thought about getting things right and felt pressure, I wouldn't be able to do anything. I want him to answer for what he has done. You have to just free yourself up. I freed myself up to create a character that um, through some research I learned about how educated she was and how many languages she spoke and that she did speak out against, you know, being raped and risked her whole life. You know, I did want to honor her story and get it as accurate as I possibly could. But I also felt free to, you know, try things and give her, you know, life that is not written about. I say before all of you, I spoke the truth. Uh, and Matt, I mean, you know, it's easy to think of, of what you folks do on screen as, as performances, but, but I imagine there must be a point where it does start to feel, feel personal in a way too. I mean, I, I'm a dad, so I, I've got two young girls, seven and four. I know you're a dad too. You've got girls. Well, I mean, I think what, what, what really a, appealed to us was, was looking at this, understanding the culture, right, which we directly evolved from, and understanding that this, this woman wasn't even seen as a person. You know, a, a woman was considered property. Right, and, uh, and obviously for us, the, you know, what are the vestigial aspects of that system that remain with us today? That's, that's you know, without making the movie a TED talk or, or you know, a lecture or making people eat their broccoli, it's, it's just, 
you know, something we want people to you know, reflect on and think about. And, and I think the film does a good job of bringing up a lot of really interesting things to, to, to think about and talk about. I decided I was guilty. No, your lunch. One of the real pleasures for me was, you know, I kind of collaborated with my eldest child, who's a uh, female, and um, gave her the script at various stages and asked for her feedback because she's very interested in these issues and mindful of this stuff. And one of the things that she said to me was, like, I, I don't, I think we are more interested today in a story that's about uh, the complications and nuances of consent rather than a story about like a man climbing in a woman's bedroom, breaking into a woman's bedroom window. In other words, the conversation is really important and relevant, but has also evolved to a place where we're, we're exploring other aspects. And uh, it was just an added satisfaction for me as a father to uh, be able to have my work connect with, with my children and hear feedback. And that was really, really joyful. And my kids were like, you're working with Matt and Ben? <laughs> Bull. Uh -uh. They're like, who? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I will not be patronized by this squire. You and Matt have been friends for an awfully long time. Watching the film, though, I mean, it, you play characters that despise each other. Uh, it was fun. I mean, the, the movie's themes and subjects are not fun or funny, but there is something absurd and sort of funny about the degree to which men uh, compete and, uh, and their vanity and their egos. Matt's character was in fact just not well liked. I mean, just loathed. He was not a guy who people wanted to be around or liked. So I wanted to sort of play into that to, to help fuel the dynamics that, that are part of the engine of the story. And yes, it was also fun to have Matt have to kneel and bow and scrape because it's a <laughs> lifelong goal of mine. <laughs> I'm getting all those, those text uh, chat pings telling me Time to wrap, time to wrap, we're out of time. Uh, so thank you thank so much genuinely for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, really appreciate it. What a cool interview. Alberta is contemplating sticking to daylight saving time, but not everyone's on board. Winter will feel so much worse than that bad week or two that we have in the spring when we spring forward. Coming up, the referendum that will determine the winter sunrise, plus. It's really windy and it's going sideways? No, thank you. <laughs> BC is about to get pummeled with days of rain and more extreme weather could be on the way this winter. We'll explain next. Welcome back. On Monday, Albertans will head to the polls once again in the province's municipal elections. But there's more at stake than local government. Daylight saving time is on the ballot with voters deciding whether to switch to it permanently. Carolyn Dunn shows us what that means and why some experts are warning against it. As the sun rises on Alberta on municipal election day, a referendum question could mean next spring will be the last time Albertans will turn their clocks ahead. On the ballot, the chance to put Alberta on permanent daylight saving time starting next fall. Moving the clock back and forth comes with damaging effects. Uh, we know there's an increased rate of car accidents uh, that following week. Uh, people don't feel well, they feel tired all week long. Uh, there's increased rates of strokes uh, and car, uh, sorry, heart attacks that week as well. But Professor Michael Antel says the better choice would be permanent standard time. He worries about the effect of people starting their day in darkness. That chronic desynchrony that's going to last for about five months over the winter will feel so much worse than that bad week or two that we have in the spring when we spring forward. Alberta adopted daylight saving back in 1971 as the result of a plebiscite. They're also deciding on whether this will be the last province in Canada to adopt daylight saving time. Keeping it constant through the year would mean in December, for example, the sun will rise in Alberta between 9.30 a.m. in the south and nearly 10 o'clock in the north. The idea of such a late sunrise is drawing mixed reviews with voters. I like waking up with the sun personally. I think it's good for uh, your health in general, uh, especially mental health, depression, etc. Uh, more and more of my friends are w doing jobs that are from home anyways. So the light doesn't really make a difference uh, for what their work schedules are. Indeed, in Yukon, where they adopted permanent daylight saving time last year, it's working out okay for the most part. Where instead of people who work nine to five driving to work in the dark and driving home in the dark, but then when they come out at the end of the day, there's still a little bit of light left. 
Some studies suggest people use those hours to shop or stay active. If Albertans vote in favour of permanent daylight saving time, they'll be joining BC, the US Pacific states and other provinces moving in the same direction. It's going to take a week of sunsets to know the results of the referendum. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. For more on this referendum question and the potential health impacts, I'm joined by Mahmoud Mustafa, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Calgary. Good evening. Good evening, Gasha. Thank you for having me. Of course, thank you for being on the program. As we heard, there are significant health concerns with changing the clocks back and forth, but there's also concern that permanent daylight saving time would put us out of sync with the sun, in particular during winter when the sun won't really rise until 10 a.m. in some places. What effect do you think that has on people? It's a lot of effect. Like imagine uh, you have to wake up one hour earlier every day for five months. That's a lot of, that's you need, you have to drive to school, drive to work one hour earlier. And um, you feel like you missed one hour of uh, sleep. Um, imagine you're driving this uh, way. That means there's lots of accidents. You are stressed. The mental health is impacted. And um, over that, you're driving during dark. Sleep deprivation, you know, just so dangerous. And there are concerns as well during the summer. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is, I'll go back again to sleep because um, uh, consistent and uh, sufficient sleep is important for our kids' um, brain development. So imagine that um, here in Alberta, here in Calgary, the sun won't set until it's 10 p.m. So kids who got used to uh, sleep routine around 8 or 9 p.m. over the um, the winter will find it hard, especially in June and July, to go back to sleep at 8 and 9 p.m. because it's still bright outside. They, they want us to keep playing until uh, 9 or almost 10 p.m. So having interruption to their, their sleep routine will impact their brain development and will affect our generations to come. I lived in Edmonton. It definitely messed with my system for a while. Uh, you believe yeah. permanent standard time is a better option, but voters only have two options on this ballot. It's either stay the same or daylight saving time. What do you recommend? Permanent daylight saving time is the worst of the two options. So I encourage everyone I know to vote no for this. We don't need, uh, uh, yes, um, having to uh, spring forward and backward uh, twice a year is much less harmful than having permanent daylight saving time. And after rejection of this proposal, we can then um, talk to our uh, representative and MLAs to have another referendum to make permanent standard time is the option here in Alberta. Mahmoud, appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. An atmospheric river is bringing extreme rain to British Columbia's southern coast. Flood watches are in place. CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff shows us why this may be a sign of things to come for the rest of the country. This is an atmospheric river. Okay, well technically this is the result of an atmospheric river, a long duration heavy rain event brought to us by a plume of moisture that stretches across the Pacific. And today is just day one of the drenching rain that will take us right through to Sunday morning. And with rainfall totals well over 100 millimeters for the south coast. After a summer like we had, that heat dome, this is a mix of beneficial to make up for that rain deficit and hazardous with a risk of flooding and mudslides a concern over the next couple of days. These are telltale signs of the season ahead. We are officially in a La Nina year. The signal of La Nina is weaker as you head east across the country, but it can also mean a stormier season ahead for the Great Lakes and Atlantic Canada. This La Nina is what meteorologists are calling a double dip. Last winter, we were actually in a La Nina. We came out of it for our hottest summer on record, and now we're right back in. Climate change means the extreme El Ninos and La Ninas are going to become even more extreme. Instead of the big ones happening every one in 20 years, we're talking one in every 10 years. This year, 
NOAA gives it an 87% chance that this La Nina will be a moderate to strong event that lasts right through to next February. Johanna Wagstaff, CBC News, in the Atmospheric River. Next on The National, Italy's new COVID green pass has many seeing red. Italy now has Europe's toughest COVID safety protocols for the workplace, but reaction is spilling out into the streets. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Two more provinces are mandating vaccinations for public sector employees. In Yukon, government workers have until the end of next month to be fully vaccinated, while in Newfoundland and Labrador, they have until December 17th, or they face the possibility of being placed on leave without pay. Italy now has the strictest COVID-19 measures in all of Europe with its new green pass system. Under the rules, public and private workers must show either proof of vaccination, existing immunity, or get tested every two days before they're allowed to go to work. Megan Williams shows us their reaction. Frustration at some of Italy's major ports, workers temporarily blocking goods, a small protest against the new green pass and a far cry from the violence seen nearly a week ago in Rome. But in the vast majority of Italian workplaces, the first day of checking the COVID health passes went off without a hitch. Everyone from employees to executives, like the head of HR at this national cleaning company, have their green pass checked. He says of the company's 2,000 workers, only one refused. The worker can't be fired, but he can be suspended without pay and faces a fine of up to $2,000 for entering the workplace. 90% of our workers are fully vaccinated, he says, with more waiting for their second shot. The challenge is dealing with the small numbers who refuse. We don't want to pay for their regular tests. In sectors where workers are on the go, checking the passes is a challenge, like Rome's 8,000 taxi drivers. So there'll be spot checks, in this case by police. And customers can ask to see their passes too. 80% of Italians over 12 have been fully vaccinated, 85% with at least one shot. But the small group of holdouts is a worry for pharmacists. The unvaccinated need to get tested every other day, adding pressure to pharmacies like this one in central Rome. We've had to extend our opening hours to handle all the requests. Despite concerns about an increase in demand at pharmacies like this one for the test and who's going to be paying for the tests, the government, employers or private citizens, for the most part, Italy's new workplace requirement of the Green Pass has gone very smoothly. Megan Williams, CBC News, Rome. A chilling exhibit in Prince Edward Island is sure to put you in the Halloween spirit. First of all, know that everything is deadly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll show you some of the spookiest artifacts in this museum next in our moment. Stick around. This was an accident. We don't know that. You've been playing games with my daughters, Terry. You're going to give me this one. Just in time for Halloween, you can get a taste of the spooky side of Prince Edward Island at this new museum exhibit. From deadly poisons to fatal fashion, the cabinet of killer curious in Summerside features PEI artifacts with a macabre past, and its debut is tonight's moment. First of all, know that everything is deadly. <laughs> Basically, uh, we've got a few different things to share. Uh, some things uh, refer to the Victorian era uh, household goods that would have had purposes but also might kill you. There's different dyes that they would use that were very popular. Um, Paris green is a, is a well-known one. You would be uh, wearing this beautiful green dress that made you look very uh, perhaps like opulent and fashionable. You looked great, um, but it was going to kill you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't think they've found evidence of crocodiles in PEI. But yeah, we have uh, a crocodile here who uh, we're looking for a name for him, but he's awfully cute. 
we, we've all loved him very much internally and we're excited to get to share him with, with the folks that uh, they can come and check him out. Something for everyone. <laughs> One thing you didn't get to see is a barber chair, and apparently the colors in the barber pole represent blood, veins, and bandages. Because apparently, the site director says back in the day, you could go to the barber and get your hair done, your teeth pulled, you could have bloodletting done. It was a one-stop shop. Well, that is The National. I'm Asha Tomlinson. It's October 15th. Good night.